Hi everyone, uh, and welcome to History Week 2021. Uh, and this year we're exploring all sorts of history from the ground up, our theme for this year. So my name is uh, Matt Allen, and I'm delighted to be hosting this panel on the future of the academic historian. I'd like to begin by acknowledging country. I'm in Armadale on Anawan country, as is the university I work at, the University of New England. And I'd like to acknowledge their elders, as well as the elders of the Dungadi, the Gamilaroi, and the Gumbayinga, uh, who share in the keeping of this country. Of course, every university in Australia is built on land that was never ceded. As I've already implied, I am, for my sins, an academic historian. When I got this job seven years ago, I couldn't believe my luck. Uh, and I'm very aware of what a privilege it is to have an ongoing position in academia, especially as I see so many brilliant scholars who aspire to and deserve positions like mine failing to get one. The imposter syndrome everyone feels in early career academia is only heightened by the sense that you were part of a shrinking, privileged class. The acute crisis of COVID has exacerbated an ongoing decline in funding for our universities, and especially the humanities, like history, with the government promising an promoting sorry, an ideological agenda that links funding to job-ready graduates and industry-linked research. So in this context, I'm very excited to be chairing a panel on the future of academic history. I'm joined by four academics who each bring a different perspective on our profession, our past, and what the future may hold. Professor Melanie Oppenheimer, Dr. Andre Brett, Professor Eric Eklund, and Professor David Lowe. We'll hear from each speaker in turn and then have an opportunity to take questions. So there won't be questions in between each, um, each presentation and hopefully then spark a wider conversation. So please save your questions in the end uh, and you can type them into the chat or you can raise your hand um, when, we, when we get to that point. Can I also take this opportunity to ask you to mute your microphone uh, until you're invited to speak to avoid background noise? Um, the other thing I'll note just before we get started is that for those seeking closed captions and transcripts, they're not available in the live event, but they will be made available in the recording, which will be released uh, by the History Council's YouTube channel. Um, and you can subscribe to that YouTube channel. There are instructions on the History Council's website. Um, but to, be, to lead us off, uh, I'd like to introduce Professor Melanie Oppenheimer. Um, professor, uh, Melanie Oppenheimer is Professor and Chair of History at Flinders University. She took up the role in mid-2013 and was the first woman and Australianist to be appointed to the position. She's resigned from Flinders and will leave in November this year and continue her work at the Australian National University. She's published widely on topics such as women and war, the history of volunteering and voluntary organisations, and soldier settlement. Melanie is now working on a history of the League of Red Cross Societies, a biography of the Munro Fergusons, the Imperial Power Couple, and a project on rural volunteering. Melanie. Great, thank you very much, Matt. And I'd like to thank the History Council of New South Wales for this invitation to participate in this panel. And I come to you from the land, lands of the Dungutty people in New, Northern New South Wales, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Well, this is a very good, gloomy topic for a beautiful spring sunny afternoon. It's as if we academic historians are a dying breed. Are we an endangered species? I think not. Let me explain why. There's no doubt that at the moment, especially for those of us in lockdown, it's hard to get past the disruption of the COVID-19 pandemic. Since March 2020, our lives have been turned upside down. Our plans have been dashed. Everything, or most of everything, is on hold. The personal and the professional have merged, and the changes that have occurred means that our working lives and our home lives are more constrained. They're more intertwined, with boundaries blurred. And it will not be the same as before when we eventually emerge from this crisis. <laughs> certainly not for a very long time. The university sector, our main employer, has suffered, although many of them still may seem to make a profit. I don't quite understand that. But anyway, it's probably one of the worst affected sectors, along with tourism, hospitality, small business. And those of us who work within it, either as academics or as professionals, have seen and felt the consequences firsthand. With universities using the chaos of the pandemic, to undergo restructures and wholesale job cuts. Secondly, the introduction of the job ready legislation last year was a low blow. The Commonwealth government too, using the pandemic as a way to introduce reforms that they have longed to do. 
Many in the sector, including the Australian Historical Association, which is the peak body for all historians in Australia, of which I currently serve as president, fought hard last year. We lobbied politicians, we lobbied crossbench senators, but we failed. So the Australian university system, I think, appears to be broken or certainly tinkering on the edges. Many thousands have lost jobs, including academic historians, from those who work as casuals right up to the professoriate, in targeted redundancies, forced or otherwise, and others have walked away. So yeah, this does sound like a pretty gloomy scenario. But academic historians within the university sector have been under pressure before, as historians such as Hannah Forsyth, Stuart McIntyre, James Waghorn and others have told us. Since the 1980s, Australian university history departments and those who work within them have regularly felt the blowtorch of unwelcome change. I mean, remember, either through processes and pressures of developments in the discipline, remember the linguistic turn, the arrival of Foucault, postmodernism. However, in many ways, it was the structural reforms of Dawkins, which ended the binary system of universities and colleges of advanced education that has had the biggest impact. Now, for my entire academic career, starting as a level A right through to professor, working in four different universities, history has been under threat in some form or another. I completed my PhD in 1997 after securing a level A position two years earlier at UWS Nepean campus, which was part, which, uh, part of the Dawkins changes. And every three years from that point on, there was a restructure. I even spent three years um, in a business school teaching labor history amongst other topics before moving back to the humanities in the next restructure three years on. In 1999, the Australian Historical Association commissioned a report to assist the profession in lobbying against continued cuts to history within their universities. The table published in the AHA Bulletin, which is the forerunner of History Australia, makes for sobering reading. And I'd like to thank David Carment for um, reaching into his bookshelf and digitising a copy of the bulletin for me. The situation as reported by the heads of history then was dire. And I'm just going to read you just a couple of little extracts to illustrate my point. We are now rather in the position of the Antarctic ice shelf, living on our not inconsiderable past mass, but melting remorselessly away, wrote Mark Elvin from the Pacific Asian History Area at ANU. And this is a shout out for you, Andre. Despite healthy numbers of students, Eamon Murphy from Curtin University said, the school is facing a very severe financial situation with the strong possibility of staff cuts. Eric Richards, my predecessor from Flinders wrote, anxiety is prevalent um, about job security. And at Latrobe, Alan Frost reported a loss of 45% of staff. The brilliantly dry Jill Rowe, my supervisor of my PhD from Macquarie University, simply wrote, like the poor in America, we manage. So that was over two decades ago. They are writing about the first five years of my academic career. And here I am now at the pointy end of my career in 2021, and here we go again, another period of crisis, albeit it's a different one, but still it's crisis, job cuts, financial insecurity, pressures on our discipline. The AHA was founded in August 1973 in Perth at the 45th ANZUS Congress. We will celebrate our 50th anniversary at our conference to be held at Monash University in July 2023. And if there is no future for academic historians, then there's no future for the AHA either, as many of our members, not all of course, we are a very broad church, but many of our members have an association or attachment to universities, either as undergrad students or postgrads, ECRs, current or retired academics. And as president, I have no intention over presiding over a peak organisation whose membership is going the way of the dodo. In my opinion, the AHA has a bright future if the current executive committee is anything to go by. And we've just revamped our website and I 
you know, encourage you to go and have a look and see the people who are currently volunteering their time uh, working for the AHA. Um, we are adapting. We are changing. We are working within the challenging times we find ourselves in. We're finding new ways to work and to support our members. A major feature of our strategy is to seek charitable status, which we have done, and we are now registered with the ACNC, the Australian Charities Not-for-Profit Commission. And we are currently awaiting a determination by the Register of Cultural Organisations, or ROCO, so that we can receive tax-deductible donations for our new AHA public fund that will raise monies for our precariat members, for prizes and the like. The AHA is also completing a large survey of history graduates. We had over 720 responses. And armed with this new data, we hope this report to be released next year will assist us in advocating and lobbying for the discipline of history. So to conclude, what is the future of academic historians? Well, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. However, I believe that using um, language such as a shrinking privileged class to describe academic historians who have ongoing positions, I think, that's, I think that's a little bit unhelpful because I think it seeks to divide us, not to unite us. We have to continue fighting together for what we believe in, for the kind of university that we wish and hope to work in, for an ethical and sustainable future that we can leave for future generations of historians. Schools and universities will continue to teach history, although the fight goes on regarding what types of history, a la, you know, Australia's latest education minister's ill-informed comments. And there will be jobs to teach those students. We will evolve, we will survive, and I hope that we will thrive. Thank you. Thanks so much, Melanie. And um, I, I think I endorse your, your correction of my... <laughs> My uh, introductory comments, I, I agree with you. We've got to stick in this together. Um, so next up, we have Dr. Andre Brett, who's currently working at the University of uh, Wollongong and is moving to a job at Curtin uh, in the beginning of next year. Um, so he's an early career historian who's published widely on Australian and New Zealand history, he recently held a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Wollongong and the Australian Academy of the Humanities awarded him the 2021 Max Crawford Medal for Exceptional Achievement and Promise. This semester, he's teaching at Wollongong and at Central Queensland University ahead of taking up an ongoing role as a lecturer of history at Curtin University next year. Andre. Well, thank you, Matt. Thank you to the History Council for having me. And uh, kia ora koutou, everyone. I'm a uh, Pakeha New Zealander uh, currently on uh, unceded Dural lands in the Illawarra. Uh, and uh, you can tell we've been in lockdown for a while with this haircut that I'm rocking. Um, so uh, I would like to talk today um, about the state of play for early career researchers and the academic precariat. Those historians whose employment is precarious, casual and routinely not remunerated adequately. Uh, I have become one of the fortunate few. Uh, I will be lecturer of history, as Matt just said, at Curtin University in Perth from January 2022. Um, you won't be surprised then that uh, processes of applying for jobs and the mobility needed to take them up are on my mind right now. Uh, I received my PhD from Melbourne in 2014. And between then and now, I have been many things, uh, a tutor, a research assistant, a postdoctoral fellow, a historian for television. Uh, and I've moved into state to chase the dream. But in those seven years, I never had secure ongoing employment. I trained to be an academic historian, and I never planned to be anything else, uh, which is perhaps an absurd ambition uh, for a guy who is legally blind. But here I am. Uh, I proved wrong the creepy anonymous referee uh, who once suggested it was strange I would pursue this career. Uh, unconscious this perhaps makes me even more of an outlier um, rather than uh, thinking that if I can do it anyone can uh, I find myself wondering why me. Um, and I suppose you know to that effect there, there's a lot of talk about so-called alt-ac, um, other careers for historians with doctorates. Now, some of this is useful, but we need to put the term alt-ac in the bin on account of its dodgy uh, implications. Uh, for one thing, many people do not obtain PhDs to become academic historians. Those options are not mere alternatives 
or backups. Uh, the term is allied with the insidious notion that people who leave academia have failed or somehow given up. Uh, this is patent nonsense. Uh, but we train many people to be academic historians. It is what they aspire to and what they are talented at. What about them? So right now, I think we're experiencing an incalculable loss of knowledge as people either take one look and say, yeah, nah, to research careers, or spend years scraping together meager income in casual roles. I think back over the last decade of my life to all the friends and colleagues whose contributions to historical knowledge would have been immense, and who for one good reason after another, eventually chose to do something else. The vigorous intellectual life of my postgraduate cohort was steadily eroded and many retrained. Some have landed in careers where they produce knowledge and others do it in their spare time for the love of it. But in the majority of cases, the knowledge that they would have produced will never exist or a smaller quantity will exist than if they had been able to pursue the academic history career for which they were trained. Some of the causes for attrition are systemic, the result of funding crises that we historians have little power to alter and have long decades long backgrounds that Melanie just indicated. Um, every year when the Australian Research Council announces its DECRA recipients, I can't help noting how roughly 80 to 85% are not funded and wonder whether all of these fantastic projects will, ev will ever happen somehow, or if the majority of potential knowledge that we propose to the ARC simply never comes to fruition. What a loss to all of us, if so. All of these things that we as a society could know left unknown. I speak from experience. I failed both times I applied for a DECRA. I can assure you, though, that I will still inflict the outcomes of that research on everyone uh, just later than I might have hoped. Um, some of the intolerable demands on junior scholars are, though, perhaps within our gift to alter or at least to press for change. Uh, first, the toxic demands for mobility. I rarely applied for jobs outside Australia and New Zealand. I still remember telling a colleague I had no interest in roles in the US, who responded that this meant I was not serious about an academic career. By expecting people to move regularly and often for short-term contracts, our discipline becomes more exclusive, pushing out those with family or caring commitments or health care needs. It implies our connections to place and community are not that important, which is ironic from a discipline conscious of the significance of both in understanding the past. We act as if it should not matter in the present, but it does. I'm not going to lie. Although I have come to appreciate Wollongong, I miss Melbourne dearly. I just hope that I love Perth. So speaking of jobs, um, I hope too that we might see efforts to roll back the ridiculously long job and fellowship applications that end up consuming days or weeks of people's lives. Uh, Curtin were good in this regard. It was the smooth application process compared to so many that I have prepared in the last seven years. I dare not think about the hours I've lost filling out fields of online forms with information already in my CV. I have seen some positive moves with postdoctoral fellowships that individual universities offer, where faculties and departments seek short expressions of interest as a first stage before asking anyone to prepare lengthy applications. Here is where those of us in the system can make a meaningful difference to the burdens on those aspiring to enter it. People in precarious employment are in no position to spend days or weeks on voluminous applications, especially when success rates are so piddlingly low. We might not be able to twist the ARC's arm into uh, adapting, uh, into adopting the more reasonable processes of its international equivalents, uh, but we can seek their use in our own institutions. So if I'm honest, uh, I think we face a rocky time ahead. I'm nervous about it, uh, but immensely privileged now to be able to face it without fretting about my income every week. It seems to me that cultures of overwork are only going to get worse as more and more tasks are thrust on fewer and fewer people. It's hard to make the big arguments for the value of history and press for systemic change when you are overworked or insecurely employed. It will, be, it will require teamwork, <laughs> which uh, might be a tall ask in a discipline where we're often accustomed to uh, solitary self-directed work. 
Uh, I hope we can at least persuade the decision, the decision makers in our sector that it's people who matter the most. We often have such a focus on buildings and infrastructure when it is the people who make our universities. My great hope for the years to come is that a system that has become increasingly impersonal for students and academics alike restores some of the humanity to the humanities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. Um, a great, great insight from someone who's just come from the precariat. Um, and I think that's a very important uh, context to have for this conversation. Uh, so next up, we have Professor Eric Eklund from Federation. Uh, so Eric is a professor of history at Federation University's Gippsland campus in Victoria, an interest in labour, social and regional history and heritage. In 2015 and 2016, he was the Keith Cameron Chair in Australian History at University College Dublin. He's a former head of school and Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor at Monash University and has held appointments at the University of Newcastle, Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. and at the ANU as a visiting fellow. He was a joint winner of the Labour History Prize for the best article in 2013 and was awarded the New South Wales Premier's Prize for Regional and Community History in 2003 for his 2002 book, Steel Town. His most recent work, published in Australian Historical Studies this year, was a regional analysis of the arrival and impact of the 1919 influenza pandemic in Gippsland. Eric. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, I'd like to thank the History Council for the invitation. Uh, and um, I hope that uh, something I have to offer here is, is of interest. Uh, I don't pretend to be able to be especially broad ranging in my comments, but if I can offer you a couple of key ideas, I would be very happy. I'm coming to you today from Gunai Kurnai country, which is east of Melbourne in West Gippsland and I pay my respects to the elders past and present uh, and emerging. Uh, I work at uh, Federation University, which is a relatively new university established in 2014 as a merger between the University of Ballarat uh, and Monash Gippsland. So I first ventured into Victoria in 2008 uh, as uh, appointed a head of school at Monash Gippsland. Uh, I had been at the University of Newcastle for uh, 13 years or so. Uh, so I'm trying to give you a bit of a perspective of uh, the academic historians in the regions. And I'm gonna offer maybe a way forward at least, and let's see what you, what you make of it. Uh, I'm gonna suggest that historians in the regions uh, have very particular characteristics. They're quite embedded in their uh, local and geographic context. They often work in very specific and quite um, uh, diverse coalitions. They work with archivists, they work with librarians, they work with uh, people uh, outside of the, of the sector. And that in a sense is very much uh, required when you work in a, in a regional university. Uh, and I'm gonna suggest that maybe there's a politics there around that local embeddedness which moves beyond the national framing of the culture wars, which I think is, you know, going down uh, another dead end, you know, the same dead end we went down in the 1990s. So to put flesh into that argument, let me go back a little and talk about the um, uh, evolution of regional universities. Uh, in particular, uh, the former uh, Institutes for Advanced Education, they grew quite substantially in the 60s and, and early 70s. Uh, the campus where I'm based in Churchill in the Latrobe Valley was originally the Gippsland Institute for Advanced Education. It took its first students in 1972 after uh, construction was approved in 1968. So next year will be uh, uh, celebrating 50 years of higher education uh, at, at Churchill and the Latrobe Valley. Uh, Monash, through its period of expansion, when it started sort of gobbling up campuses in, in suburban Melbourne, it decided to go into the regions. And uh, the campus itself became a part of Monash in, in 1990. But before then, there were a range of uh, members of staff, some of whom were historians, who were gathering material, gathering archives, gathering all the published works uh, on Gippsland history, uh, and they established an archive or, or a specific uh, special purpose library, which uh, in 1985 became the Centre for Gippsland Studies. 
That subsequently merged uh, with the Fed Uni, new Fed Uni Library uh, and became uh, the Gippsland and Regional Studies Collection. Now, there's, I could tell stories about other regional universities in Australia where there are similar evolutions of a kind of a partnership between archivists, librarians and academic historians. Uh, Charles Sturt has an archive in Wagga Wagga uh, and uh, people like Jim Hagen, were, the late Jim Hagen, were heavily involved uh, in uh, helping establish and collect records in that case. Jim Hagen was also involved in uh, helping um, establish the archive at the University of Wollongong with another early staff member um, when it was at University College, uh, Ross Duncan. Uh, I think the university, and Andre might correct me, I think autonomy was 1975, uh, but the archive itself was operating from 74. There's similar cases in uh, uh, Newcastle, of course, with the wonderful archive at the University of Newcastle, run by Joni de Gravio. Uh, and I was involved in various campaigns, uh, outreach projects, in particular the Coal River Working Party, which was uh, a diverse collection of people coming together to, amongst other things, try and locate where the convict coal mines were in Newcastle. We had um, surveyors, we had engineers, as well as academics, archivists and librarians. Uh, that's still going as the Hunter Living Histories Project, which is a, a wonderful initiative. Um, Matt could probably tell us about similar histories uh, at, at UNE. So I think that uh, in terms of uh, the broad picture, yes, it is pretty grim. Um, Joy de Mercy talked about the possibility uh, in the middle of last year, the possibility of a large number of humanities courses being cut from regional universities. She expressed that concern. Uh, we have seen significant cuts at Charles Sturt. Uh, there are uh, sort of um, under the radar cuts in humanities going on at uh, Federation. Uh, another place which has very important regional archive is uh, Central Queensland University. And we know there that proportion of uh, the staff cut is, is very high, uh, something like over 400 staff. So yes, it is pretty grim, but I guess what I'm suggesting is that in the history of these regional institutions, there's a series of connections, there's a series of projects which connect academic historians, archives and communities. And I think there might be a politics around defending and protecting those kind of local assets. So there's characteristics then of these kinds of projects. They're um, typically based on very broad coalitions and the academic historian is one among many. Uh, they work with libraries and archivists, but lots of people from outside the sector. They often have diverse users, so they're not just local students, but uh, they might be family and local historians, uh, genealogists as well. And I just also wonder with great courses like, um, for example, at UNE or even UTAS, Applied uh, Local History, Family History, if there isn't also a politics to be built around that kind of outreach and that kind of support which comes through those projects. There's the other characteristic, I, I think, is that these um, projects move beyond written records. They are, they're often multimedia and they make, um, I think, a lot of uh, a, a lot of store out of uh, photographs and video material and consequently get a good impact and good reach. And finally, they're very strongly embedded in their regions. They, I think, are points of um, possible uh, political action and mobilisation, which might uh, help us move through this very difficult time that some of my colleagues have already outlined for us. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thanks for that perspective, Eric, and, and very relevant to, to um, UNE and Armadale. Um, thank you very much. Um, so finally, uh, our last speaker is Professor David Lowe. Uh, David is a Chair of Contemporary History at Deakin University and co-founder of the Australian Policy and History Network. He's a Fellow of the Academy for Social Sciences in Australia has held visiting academic positions in London, Cambridge, and Tokyo. His research focuses on modern international history, including Australia's role in the world and the remembering of prominent events. 
Recent books include with Carol Lentz, Remembering Independence, Routledge 2018, and edited with Cassandra Atherton and Alison Miller, The Unfinished Atomic Bomb, Roman, Rowan and Littlefield 2018. He's currently working on four projects, an international history of the Colombo plan for aid to South and Southeast Asia, history of Australia's foreign aid, conceptual history of Australian national security, and histories of Australia's overseas embassies. David. Thanks very much, Matt. And can I add also my thanks to the History Council of New South Wales. It's great to be part of this. And I'd like to acknowledge at the outset that I'm speaking to you from the land of the Wadawurrung people and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge also that their sovereignty was never ceded. So I joined the ranks, perhaps I'm the elder statesman here, I joined the ranks of academic historians in the early 1990s. And even during my 10 years on the dark side, working as senior manager, I've benefited hugely from the privilege of working within a disciplinary environment of historians. I'm um, making a bit of a call to the barricades in what I'm about to say. I'm suggesting that even in our sort of beleaguered state, uh, now is the time in which academic historian activists are needed more than ever. In other words, part of being a historian is not only to interpret change, but in various ways to agitate for it. So I'm gonna outline very briefly why I think historian activists, academic historian activists are very urgently needed and give some examples of activism. Hopefully, I think demonstrating that we are doing much already and there are plenty of logical opportunities to do more and people should be wanting to do more. So the urgency in my mind arises from two worrying trends. One is the erosion of governmental accountability, which is the foundation of democracy. And the other is the existential challenges posed by the climate crisis and population pressure on scarce resources. Just briefly in terms of the government accountability issue, we're of course um, right now witnessing the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 events. Soon after that episode in 2001, British Prime Minister Tony Blair declared publicly that there was no precedent for what we'd just seen and what we were faced with. And in doing so, he swiftly committed British troops to Iraq in the hunt for weapons of mass destruction that had not been shown to exist. Now, historians leapt to point out how many usable, usable precedents, in fact, there were, and how he shouldn't give himself carte blanche to do whatever he liked without historical and other markers by which to be judged. But the Tony Blair episode has since been copied by other leaders or tried to be copied by other leaders in terms of um, removing themselves from history in order to remove themselves from accountability. We've witnessed a growing aversion to openness and accountability in governing at different rates and in different ways in democratic systems akin to our own in Australia and including our own. The British, British government misrepresentations and evasions have been prominent factors in episodes such as the British vote on Brexit and um, after the vote on the consequences of leaving Europe. Of course, the Donald Trump term of presidency in the US threw into sharp relief how explicitly anti-democratic governance and posturing could tear at the fabric of rules and conventions that had, whatever their shortcomings, at least aspired to hold those in power to account. And the COVID-19 pandemic that we're enduring at the moment has encouraged in many governments a propensity towards even greater levels of secrecy and to undermining and underfunding those institutions most likely to shine awkward spotlights that might be revealing of government failure. In Australia's case, including Auditor General Departments, the ABC, and thinking again of our 9-11 anniversary, the 92 anti-terror laws granting extraordinary powers of government control that have been passed since, government control and suppression. The same behaviours can also be seen at the level of state governments too in Australia. The second um, urgency arrives, arises, as I said, from the, the sense of climate and resources crisis. Now, I hardly need to tease out how firmly established the dangers are that we face by not reducing carbon emissions quickly enough and the related need to demand that our governments act sooner in ways looking beyond just electoral cycles and closely connected to pressures on the biosphere that may compound the already frightening number of species extinctions, including fish and other food stocks. Our need to address the dangerous state of relationships between humans and our environment demands sustained actions of us. And for historians whose work is attentive to generational perspective, it's especially urgent and inviting. As students of human experiences and the human natural world connections, we're good at plonking ourselves in streams of time 
glancing at what had come before and also what is known or guessed at what might come next. This is especially important right now and into the near future. So I'm going to outline just very quickly three ways that I think loom likely for us by which we can enhance our activism. They all three go to both of my two concerns that I just mentioned. The first one is by making historical materials available to more people, including those involved in policy making. Um, Melanie Oppenheimer, who we've heard from, worked on um, the preservation of Australian Red Cross archives in ways that benefited historians and the general public. She knows this scene well. Knowing full well that the utility to which archival records can be put is often much wider than the intent behind the original decision to gather them. It's a form of activism speaking to future generations that demands collections be saved, preserved, be open to viewing. So to have records of voluntary organisations such as the Red Cross, in Melanie's case, made readily available is to ensure that the government managed archive is not the only way by which we interpret the past. We need to ensure that government archives too are well maintained and readily available. And so the campaign this year by the AHA, Gideon Hay, Graham Davison and others to ensure that the National Archives of Australia receive funding better matched to its needs was absolutely vital. But we also need to vary ways in which we assess agency and draw on different casts of historical characters. One example that um, I was very pleased to be involved in was on the documenting the life stories of student scholarship holders from Papua New Guinea and Indonesia over a 50 year period. These are the two countries that have been the source of more students than any other two countries by far in terms of Australian sponsored scholarships. Since the early days of the Colombo plan in the early 1950s, DFAT, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has invested many millions in sponsoring students from Asian countries to come and study and train in Australia and then return to their countries with new capabilities and skills. But Canberra has long struggled to assess the impact or success of these efforts. Surveys um, conducted afterwards face the problem of self-selecting students those who had a good time in Australia were disproportionately inclined to come forward and take part, in contrast to those who had a less good time. Tracer studies take snapshots of students who have returned home, but they are by definition fleeting snapshots. So with colleagues at Deakin, I conducted extensive life story interviews with former students. And with the help of the Deakin Library, made the transcripts available on a public Omeka site. At the same time, we urged as best we could that DFAT pursue life stories in their own evaluation research in order to appreciate how that graduate might have initially gone back to head up a section of a public service, but then later undertook another degree and moved into business or later in life provided leadership in local community or religious organisations. We had some modest success, I won't overstate our success, but DFAT has been rethinking its approach to working with alumni. There are in such endeavours um, opportunities for policy and advocacy, uh, engaging with policy and making, um, making uh, advocates positions. Students too can do this. Um, one of the most popular activities according to our recent teaching experiences at Deakin is to invite students to write imaginary policy briefs, lobbying for certain recommendations, making certain recommendations to imagined ministers. Second way in which I think we can enhance our activism is by enabling the next generations to think with rich context, to be able to zoom in and go wide lens in their understandings of change. And fostering a sensibility to think in terms of accountability and to sort out big problems from smaller ones and from distractions that are thrown up by others in a world full of conspiratorial sensationalism and echo chambers. Much of this, of course, just comes from good curriculum design and teaching doesn't have to be especially recent history. It can just as readily be ancient history as modern environmental history, but it's benefits from enabling, it benefits rather from enabling students to become history makers. They can see how views of the past change according to new questions being asked and new forms of evidence come to light. History and other humanities subjects are needed more than ever in a world of diabolically complex problems. No matter how amazing the scientific or medical breakthroughs we might hope for, they'll, they'll amount to little unless they're accompanied by widespread human acceptance or change behaviour. The anti-vaxxer efforts at the moment are a case in point. And thirdly, we can also enhance our activism by writing for a broader readership. Style matters in doing this. We know that historians can provide narratives with prominent road signs, judicious metaphors, analogies that help us all make, uh, make greater sense of the complex things we're trying to write about and make 
our writing accessible. Historians tell stories and they tell us what they think matters and how we can see ourselves within big contextual pictures of human experience. There are a number of outlets, and I think what I'm encouraged by is that there are a number of uh, increasing number of outlets for this kind of form of writing. There are long essay opportunities and various media uh, outlets and online sites. We know that things like The Conversation, uh, and I'm involved in the Australian Policy and History Network, these offer logical opportunities, but you can also build your own. You can add your own to whatever department you're writing from and construct working papers and involve students in the exercises. Now, every time I mention this, people usually say, ah, yes, but how do we demand, how do we balance rather the needs of university demands for quality underpinned by journal ranking citations and other formidable measures? How do we um, match that with the call for shorter, easily accessible forms? It is a hard act. Uh, I won't pretend that it's not, but it's not impossible. And sometimes this, the most casual forms of writing can escape ranking exercise altogether. So you can still aim at high quality on the one hand and short pieces on the other, drawing on the same materials. Now, again, on a note of encouragement by which to end, much of what I describe I think is already happening, as far as I can tell. Historians are being activists and encouraging the next generation of historical activism. And that's, I think, something, a trend that we've all got to encourage. Thanks, Matt. Um, thanks so much, David. Um, a great note to end on, um, the call to activism. Um, so look, uh, it's an opportunity now to ask questions. You can um, raise your hands or you can also type them um, into the, the Q&A um, section. Uh, and there's a couple of questions already, so I might just start with some of those. Um, so Tim Hendry has asked, uh, and I think this is an excellent question. What should a history graduate who's pursued another career do to get back into academic history? Anyone with a comment? I think, I think there's a couple of things. Um, I'll, I'll jump in. A couple of things that um, come to mind. I mean, one is you, you need to ask yourself very quickly, is is the PhD the kind of thing that um, um, I'm really set for? Can I can I gear up for that kind of uh, grueling experience? Because it is a tough experience. Um, because as we know, that is still a pathway into academic career. So that, that's step one, in my view. Um, and it's a wonderfully enriching experience, but it is quite a commitment. Um, and related to that, asking yourself that question, comes the other question is, can I actually um, become a historian without a PhD and write in interesting outlets and make an impact without a PhD, which is entirely possible as well. So for someone who's established and perhaps, you know, um, is thinking of um, careers in more ways than one, there are questions to, to ask yourself would be my way of starting to think about that. Um, Matt, can I jump in yeah, there? Absolutely, please. Yeah, thank you. It's a very interesting question, and I think people have to think very carefully before they embark on the PhD because, yeah, it, not many people get them because of the the, the rigour of, of it. Um, but the other thing, I just am reminded again of uh, Jill Rowe, and she said, you know, you have to have something to say. So it, it's not only just about, um, you, you know, you have to have a certain... Um, interest and passion, I think, uh, which sort of is, is supports what David was suggesting. But you also have to have that commitment to what it is that you wish to research in a doctorate and then be able to continue that on. And I think it's really important. If, you, if you're not really passionate, I mean, I think Andre is a great example of that passion. You need to have that passion and fire in your belly for, for sometimes upwards of six years. I think it was Andre. I was trying to do the math there. Um, but uh, I think, yeah, you need to have something to say. And if you don't, once you get into academia, I think sometimes the problem is, is that people don't have anything more to say. They forget about that. And that, I think, is something that you really need to, to consider. Um, so a follow-up actually to that then and is, is just, has just come into the chat, which is if you already have a PhD but you've not worked in academic history, what advice do you have about getting in? And I have to admit, that's a difficult question. Um, publishing is probably my, my short answer, but um, I wonder if anyone else has anything to offer there. I'll jump in again then, just firstly, yes, it's all about publications. It's about what your CV looks like. Um, 
and I've often I've encouraged students who've often just who've done an honours um, a degree, but they have a 20,000 word or 15, 20,000 word thesis, you know, write that up into an article. It, it basically academic careers are built around well, lots of things, but one of the basic um, components of that is publications um, and that so that that's the sort of thing turning that thesis into a book or whatever so that that's the that's the basic sort of um, starting point I think great um, so another question we have is from Paul Klein who asks whether we can comment on the apparent paradox between the mandating of sophisticated history courses for all school students and the worrying prospects for the discipline at university does anyone have any thoughts on that I mean, it's a long time since I studied history at school. It's not that long, I suppose, but it, it feels like a long time now for me. My memory of it is that it did the opposite of, in, of encouraging me to want to study history at university. Um, and I kind of came back to history later um, through, you know, once I was at university and saw what was on offer. But it didn't, studying Australian history at school did not excite me about Australian history. Um, I don't know whether that's still the case. I hope it isn't. But... Um, that's just an insight that I don't think. Mm, I, I would have to, you know, agree with that, that certainly I'm coming from, I suppose, quite similar background where, you know, I was originally an international relations student who just did history courses for the context. And then uh, by about my second year of undergrad, realised I was just writing a lot of history essays in disguise and, you know, jumped ship and here I am. And to, I, I think I think if you told 17-year-old me that I would be writing Australian history, I would have been very, very surprised given uh, my school experience of... I, I, I mean, I loved my history subject. I was top of history at my um, high school, but I didn't enjoy the Australian component of it. Um, and, and I think part of the problem was that where this attitude that history was something that really happened elsewhere and that what happened here was boring. So I certainly hope that things are different now and that it might, you know, inspire new, you know, the current generation to be coming on into historical studies. Just looking at New Zealand, where they've now just introduced introducing a mandatory curriculum, there's a like there's a hope that at least the need for more history teachers will lead to a rise of um, enrolments at universities. I don't know about here though. Thanks Andre and actually just as you were speaking one thing that I did think of um, and it actually goes back to the previous questions but um, in terms of if you're trying to get back into academia um, and you already have a PhD I mean one thing to think about is certainly in my experience I, I my position is formally as a historical criminologist I think you are seeing more and more people who have PhDs in history getting jobs in areas other than history um, and I think there are opportunities there potentially, and it may be an angle that you want to think about as well. Um, are there, uh, don't limit yourself to only history jobs. If you can think of ways to make yourself attractive to other jobs as well, um, that's certainly a strategy that worked for me. I mean, I was very lucky, as I say, but, um, but that, that did work for me in my experience. Um, okay, an anonymous question. Um, uh, actually for Eric. Would you liken the role of an academic historian in regional universities as comparable to being a professional historian with more public and private sector engagement? Eric, you're muted, sorry. Sorry, beg your pardon. Um, I'll try again. Uh, yeah, look, it is similar. Um, having said that, I know many of my colleagues in the capital cities and regional centres do this sort of work as well. They're, heavily engaged in, in their regions. Um, but that's been my experience. Uh, one of the first papers I gave was to the Illawarra Historical Society. And, you know, as a, as a young historian, just sort of learning my trade, um, this was a, a real eye-opener eye to me. Um, there was such remarkable uh, knowledge within that group. And, you know, I subsequently learned that, that that's actually a very powerful organisation within Illawarra society, within Wollongong uh, society. Uh, former mayors and others were, were very active in Illawarra uh, Historical Society. Um, so there is that, that sense of uh, discovering history uh, has a number of different domains. And for me, as a historian, 
uh, I had to, um, you know, move beyond this kind of anxiety about um, mastering academic and scholarly history and embrace a more vernacular style as well and, and then try to think about uh, how the two might, might productively mesh, how they might work together. Um, so for me, that's been a, a really um, a valuable uh, point of departure intellectually. And, and it's also kind of kept me sane too, because, um, you know, sometimes it's a very isolating practice. And if you just go down uh, and give a, a small talk to uh, a local history group, a family history society, it, it just, um, it just you know, really enlivens you and, and, and uh, you know, um, sort of revives your enthusiasm. Mm. Yeah, thanks, Eric. And I think, um, you know, the... I'd like to think, and I actually think this is something important for the future of, of history in general, is that the boundaries between academic history and professional history may not be as strict as they have been in the past. And that, in my view, would be a good thing. Um, so maybe Eric speaking that. Andrew, do you want to say something to that? Yeah, um, no, I think I think it's crucially important. And for me, you know, I've tried to, you know, have at least some sort of a profile doing, you know, stuff outside of the university, like writing for newspapers or doing w research for TV documentaries. And a large part of my motivation there was simply I write to be read and... You know, so much of our work ends up, you know, paywalled in academic journals and what have you. So for me, it was just natural to find other ways to um, communicate it as well. Um, and I also think it's um, often worth thinking about uh, in a very practical way, especially for early career researchers, that often a lot of these historical societies have their own, like, grants and prizes. Uh one of, easily one of the most financially lucrative things that I ever won and which kept me going at a very difficult time of employment um, was the um, Wollongong Local History Prize. Um, and this is, I think, something useful for, you know, early career historians who want to actually engage their community and also just to survive. That's what got me through last summer. Um, I'm very grateful to them. And being able to give something back to the community that you're in is really personally rewarding as well. Thanks, Andre. And I'll just quickly plug that the History Council um, offers uh, prizes in Australian history, uh, well, not just in Australian history, actually, and they're open right now on the History Council website. I think they close in like a month, Catherine. Um, anyway, very soon, but available right now. So please look at them. Um, uh, a question that kind of relates to this, actually, for any, any of the panellists. In your opinion, do you believe it is necessary to uphold history as an academic discipline? Do you think the changing approaches and forms of historical communication, things like digital history, um, historical fiction, um, are adding to or detracting from the discipline of history? Um, Melanie? I'll just unmute myself. Uh, look, I think his, the, the discipline evolves, doesn't it? It, it evolves. It, we certainly don't teach history like your cartoon. For the for the session, um, um, it it it's, it it changes. It has changed, and it continues to change and evolve. And I think that maybe now um, we are moving into a into a much more um, where the, where where the the differences between someone working having a job in a university as opposed to someone who doesn't, and uh, that the history that we write is actually quite similar in terms of. How we how we write. I mean, just to follow on from Andre's, which is also part of this point, is that I never I wanted people to always read my work right from the get go. Now, whether that's because this isn't my first career, I mean, I always loved history at school. Um, it was taught really badly when I think about it, but I just loved it for some reason. I don't know why. Um, but I did. I had another whole career before I came back. So. Um, it, it I, I've never really been pushed into that sort of, oh, well, you have to publish in a certain way or write in a certain way. And actually, my most, the favourite book that I've ever written um, was actually a book on Narelle Hobbs, The World War One Nurse, where I didn't use footnotes. I actually had notes at the back of the book, but I had this freedom. And for me, that is my favourite book that I've ever written, that I've, that I've written to date because I didn't have that, the constraints of the sort of classic 
um, academic history, footnotes, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, like it, it, I think that I am all for kind of opening up and broadening uh, what we call um, academic history. Great. Thanks, Melanie. And Eric, I can see you're, you've got a comment as well. Uh, yeah, um, it's a really interesting question. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm fairly open-minded too about the parameters of the discipline, but what I'm especially concerned about is, is a kind of a, you know, the transition in the last couple of decades to a kind of post-truth world where, you know, uh, kind of critical analysis, uh, rational engagement, uh, is is kind of gone out the door. Um, uh, regional Australia is is awash with um, you know Sky News and and rubbish on Facebook. And you know we need to uh, give our students models in order to assess and analyse and and understand where this stuff comes from and how to critique it. Uh, and that you know history is great for that, but so are all the other humanities disciplines. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's especially relevant when, uh, you know, we have uh, such a, a problematic and, and eroded public discourse. Um, and just relating to this, actually, another question um, coming from Sarah Whitehouse, who's a Year 12 history student, she says, um, Mr Lowe talked about uh, the accessibility of history through writing and language. How does that fit in with the academic rigour of the profession? Um, and this is actually, she says, a key point in the debate of popular versus academic history in the extension history course. That sounds like a much better history course than the one I did. Um, David, do you have a comment on that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And I think Sarah's touched on a point of tension because, you know, there are expectations on academic historians to write in prestigious journals all the time. But I think one way of, a good way of looking at it is to think that there will be rigour in, in the research that you undertake no matter what you do. And my hope mm. would be that um, having completed the work, you can then find ways of condensing that and making it into, um, you know, really easily digestible forms. So the rigour doesn't disappear, that underpins the whole enterprise. But in addition to aiming at that journal or whatever outlet your, your, your department might want you to, you can draw on the same bedrock of research and the same methods to write something that is, is quite different as well. Right. Okay. Look, I think we're going to need to wrap up very soon, but I've got one more question here from Warwick Anderson. Um, uh, and I think maybe this goes to you at the first instance, David, as well. Should existential threats like global heating and ecological degradation leading to disease emergence in the current pandemic change fundamentally the way we do academic history? So much discussion of the future of academic history seems predicated on preserving and publicizing history as usual, which we've been doing for decades. Not that we can't do both, of course, just that many history departments still seem conservative methodologically and topically. Do you have a comment on that? I'll David, have a quick anyone? comment, but I'm sure others may too. Very quickly, Warwick, thanks. Yeah, look, um, th there's a bit of a tension um, around that, but, but sometimes beneath the titles of um, history subjects, you can find, or at least in, in the case at Deakin, you can find some really interesting methodological innovation creeping in, whether it be the oceanic turn in, in materials that I'm working with now, seeing the world from the point of view of oceans, many others, which just nurture this sensibility that you're talking to. My fellow panellists might have other, th other thoughts as well. Um, anyone else? Should we be doing academic history the same way? Well, um, well, it's it's a really tough question um, because you know the same the same sort of capacities and civic mindedness that that history encourage is the kind of stuff that can unpick uh, you know the the arguments of the deniers. Um, so for me, for me, it's just uh, all the more urgent. I, I know it feels like the same. And, and in a way, it is the same. Um, it just seems more urgent to do it more effectively. I'm actually just wondering too, whether when we come out of the pandemic, um, the, the move to digitizing our sources and this idea that now we don't actually have to go to the archive, wherever that might be, we can just do it um, through the digitized record. Um, I'm wondering how that is actually going to change not only um, about um, how we work, but what we work on. And yeah, I think it's, oh, oh, sorry, Andrew, go, please. I think also that rise of digitalization changes who can participate because it allows people who are, you know, 
who I struggle, you know, financially or time-wise or health-wise to get to these archives can now access this large mass of material at home and provide new ways of doing history, new perspectives on it. I think that enriches the discipline um, immensely. And um, yeah. Yeah, and I'll just add a comment as well. I mean, I think one of the great things that's happened for me in being an original university is that with COVID, we've had to have conferences online. And I don't think we're going to go back from having the option of being online in the future. And I think that's a fantastic thing, both for students who can't afford to go because the conference is too expensive, um, but also just in general to make them more accessible to people. I think there's a real opportunity there to change the academic conference from just being a small club of, of academics, which is certainly valuable, but to being something that's a bit more accessible um, and open and democratic, potentially. Um, okay, but I think we're going to need to wrap it up here. Um, thank you, everyone, for um, all my panelists and all the um, all the uh, the audience for making such a lively um, and engaging panel. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the support of the New South Wales government through Create New South Wales, as well as um, the other cultural partners and history supporters of History Week, and of course the History Council's terrific staff, Catherine Shirley and Cassandra Rogers. Um, there's still one more day of History Week 2021, so please stay involved and keep making history. Subscribe to the History Council's YouTube channel to access a recording of this session and stay in touch with our other events. So until next time, thank you all very much for attending and goodbye.